Hi, I'm Kelly Keller, and uh, <laughs> good evening. I welcome you all in the name of uh, Jesus Christ and in the name of Countryside Community United Church of Christ. Welcome to this Center for Faith Studies lecture and uh, presentation by uh, Gary Ferguson. Been looking forward to that very much. Affirmation three of the, of the uh, 12 Phoenix Affirmations, which uh, many of our congregation follow, reads this way. Christian love of God includes celebrating the God whose spirit pervades and whose glory is reflected in all of God's creation, including the earth and its ecosystems, the sacred and secular, the Christian and non-Christian, the human and non-human. It reflects that deep intuition uh, that um, our experience and our experience of God's creation are, off, are, are very much overlap, perhaps one and the same. And in that regard, I'm impressed by Gary's uh, writing where he, he writes, I began my career by exploring the tracks humans have left in nature. Now, I'm mostly interested in the tracks nature leaves in us. Nature leaves nature's tracks in us. God leaves God's tracks in us. And oftentimes those tracks are one and, and the same. If you are, uh, uh, this is your first time to Countryside Church, just a couple of notes. Uh, one is if, if you uh, like the restroom, it's out to the left and to the left. You'll find it there. And for anybody, if you have one of these um, things in your pockets uh, called a cell phone, if you wouldn't mind turning that to off or stun or vibrate or whatever it takes to not ring, <laughs> that would be appreciated uh, by everyone, uh, probably most of all, including our, our, our speaker. So at this time, I'd like to invite our director for the Center for Faith Studies forward to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Although I'm going to sit right back down because he already took a couple things I was going to say. Um, no, thank you, Eric. And thank you to all of you for coming out this evening on a, such a beautiful fall evening. And uh, I definitely, um, with great pleasure, am introducing Gary Ferguson tonight. Um, Gary, as you have read, perhaps, um, has traveled all over the um, on land and on water, um, and actually has traveled all over this nation just to get here tonight. <laughs> I heard a funny story that they, to get to Omaha from Montana, they went to Seattle. So, um, and then to get back to Billings, they're going to go to Portland first. So, um, they just like to travel. <laughs> Um, so, no, we, we're very grateful that you made the trip here tonight. Um, Gary has written over 22 books and has been published in magazines uh, from uh, Vanity Fair to Los Angeles Times to, uh, Orion, most recently, Orion, which actually one of our members gets, and she opened it up and went, oh, that's our speaker tonight. Um, so you're going to be signing that tonight, maybe, um, if you, if you are, will grace her with that. Um, tonight, though, uh, Gary's lecture culminates our fall series on who do you say that I am, conversations with the soul. And as Eric uh, so deftly described, we I, I kind of think Gary's bringing us back to the very beginning of this conversation, right? That we, in the Garden of Eden, our story tells us, is where we began to understand ourself and our God in relationship with others. It started in nature. And I'd invite us all just to take a moment. Just kind of close your eyes and breathe in. And think of one of those sacred places where maybe you heard that still, small voice. Maybe you found the truest sense of yourself. Find that place. This week, we may be wary and weary and we need to remember these places and commune with these places. And I ask you to bring that peace that you're finding within yourself right now. And open your hearts and your ears and help me to welcome Gary Ferguson tonight. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. 
What a pleasure to be here in such a beautiful, beautiful sanctuary. And I've been hearing about some of your future projects and plans, uh, all good stuff. There was such a, I think, a, a, a palpable um, welcome just walking in the door of this place. And it always suggests to me that some good people with good hearts have, have been in a, in a space to create that sort of feeling. So thank you. Um, I'm also excited to let you know that my wonderful, brilliant wife, Dr. Mary Claire, is here tonight, and she's going to be joining me uh, at various times because she's a, just a magnificent conversationalist. She's a cultural and devel developmental psychologist as well, and I think that some of her insights and her ability to help us converse about these somewhat difficult topics uh, is going to be a real treat. So I. I greatly appreciate her being here and being with us tonight. This is, I, I understand, the last of the, this particular season's lecture series. I wanted to say that this is also more or less the beginning of the storytelling season in cultures around the world. As the fall ended and winter came on, it was the time people told stories, telling stories about who we are, about what our hopes are, uh, stories to anchor us, give us a sense of place, a position in the world, a position with our family, to declare what we're grateful for and sometimes what we're afraid of. And so I'm going to be talking about a story that is, in fact, a grief journey, but um, that's not necessarily a, a, a downer subject. It's uh, been my experience through this grief journey, and I'll tell you more about that, that it ended up opening me two sides of myself and the world, my community um, that I didn't, and even of the natural world that I just didn't possess before. So for those of us who find ourselves in difficult circumstances, and we, many of us may feel that way just after 601 days of an election campaign uh, for the presidency, um, that too can be a, a kind of journey that leaves us feeling a bit disoriented. Uh, and, and one that we would be well served to talk about and figure out how we're going to uh, reimagine ourselves and our lives uh, and our place in this, in this country as we move forward. This particular grief journey that I'm going to start with happened back in uh, the spring of 2005. My first wife, Jane, and I had been married about 25 years, and we were heading off to Ontario from Montana to uh, participate in one of the world's great whitewater uh, canoeing schools. At that point, we had from the Everglades to the Arctic and hundreds of places in between. We had probably 30,000 miles of trail under our boots at that point, much of it in the Rockies, but also all over the country, uh, including the Midwest and the Northeast. And we thought that what would be a better way to celebrate um, our upcoming 25th anniversary than to, to, to get even better at one of the things we love to do, which was whitewater canoeing. After the school was over, which went very well, we happened upon uh, a person who mentioned uh, a small river in northern Ontario in a remote place uh, called the Kopka River. And this particular river and our experience of it was supposed to just be a, a couple hour post-breakfast paddle. Uh, there was nothing particularly difficult of the river except for one stretch. One stretch had about a 200 yard run of class 5 whitewater in it. And class 5 whitewater, if you know any of you are paddlers, is not something that's ever run in an open canoe. And so the way people managed that stretch of the Kopka River was to take the boat out and, and follow a portage trail around that 200 yards of whitewater. Well, that portage trail, as it happened, had been closed due to a massive blowdown of timber about chest high for miles around from an ice storm a couple years before, and the advice was to go actually up closer to the head of the rapid, take out there, and and through a somewhat difficult carry along the shore, um, get around the rapids that way. Well, as it turned out, there had been historic levels of rain in the week prior, creating some very strange hydraulics. And um, long story short, we got swept into that class five rapids right down the throat of it. It was a thunderous, frightening experience, as you can imagine, five foot high, 
waves coming over the bow of the boat, filling the boat with many gallons of water. And if you have ever been canoeing, you know that it's not the most stable craft in the world anyway. And so it was not a matter of if we were going to tip. It was a matter of when. And we probably made it about 100 yards, maybe a little more, through that white water. And then the boat became unmanageable. It turned sideways and was... uh, Uh, pushed up against a rock, and we were tossed into the river. As for me, at that point, I had to pull myself out of my knee straps, uh, hearing the, the, the boat thundering against the granite boulders while I was doing that. I popped up, was shot down the rapids, and twice got into recirculation pools, they're called, where uh, they, they sort of recirculate the water, and um, sometimes they can pin swimmers or boaters underneath the water, and that's what happened to me. And it got to the point where I was inhaling water and thought, well, I'm drowned, but then was kicked out and pushed further down uh, the rapids. And then right before the flat flush pond, there was about a six-foot small waterfall, and I got pitched over that, and my leg went into a rock crevice and snapped in several places. Um, that rock crevice is, is commonly referred to as a foot entrapment, a leg entrapment, and that's how a lot of boaters actually die. You get your foot caught, and then the, the river bends you over with your foot caught, and of course you can't breathe. Later speculation by some of the search profess- professionals who came in onto the scene said that had my leg not snapped, that probably would have been the end of of me, but uh, when it snapped, I got kicked out and knocked into the flush pond. I waited there and waited for Jane to uh, to to show up, and and she didn't. And so I knew I had to go get help. Word of where we were, and if we weren't going to call, if we hadn't called our our shuttle driver by nine that night, then he would know something was wrong and call for help. This was about eleven in the morning, and I wasn't willing to wait eight hours for help to arrive. So I took a a balsam fir branch and lashed it to my leg and made a crutch out of the canoe paddle, tied the canoe up to a tree so if Jane did show up, she would know I was all right from having seen that the canoe was tied up. I then set out walking on a high cliff above that stretch of rapids, calling into the roar, uh, hoping to hear something, hearing nothing, and then finally began essentially crawling out through that chest-high timber toward a highway, the Armstrong Highway, where I hoped to get help. And about a half a mile from the highway was picked up by uh, some very inebriated EMTs. Uh, The good news was they were EMTs, and they took me back to the Armstrong Highway, uh, flagged down somebody with a phone, made a call, and uh, that set the search and rescue in motion set a helicopter out of a Thunder Bay hospital to come and get me and take me back there to be tended to. And it also began a three-day search for Jane, um, which was unspeakably difficult, as you can imagine. As it turned out, in the end, there was a team of uh, search dogs who were trained to smell scents coming from under the water. This was essential because the water was very tannin-colored because of all the spruce and fir. It had a lot of tannin in it, and so it was murky, the color of tea, so they couldn't really see anything. And finally, on the third day, after having gone up and down the river for many days, the dogs pointed, and with a lot of careful looking and ultimately a high ropes rescue recovery effort, the team found Jane's body. Um, a couple of things I wanted you to know, as this is a, a tragic story, of course. It was interesting to me, and it really didn't comfort me for quite a while, but ultimately it did, and it does to this day. Right before this particular stretch of rapids, we were on a lake, and a pair of loons surfaced right next to the boat, and this is not normal behavior for loons. They're very skittish and shy. Jane had a very special relationship with loons. The sun broke out right as the loons popped up next to the boat. Jane put her And her very last words was to look up at the sky and basically say, thank you, universe. That was it. That was really one of her last images, one of her last thoughts. And now, all these years later, I do take some comfort in the fact that she did have that level of pure joy right before um, she died. Now, interestingly enough, 
a couple days before this tragic wreck, she turned to me in our Chevy van, which we bought in 1970 and renovated and had up in Canada. She turned to me driving down the highway and said, out of the blue, you know, if something ever happens to me, I want my ashes scattered, right, in, in my five favorite wild places. And I thought it was bizarre. We hadn't talked about that for 12 years. I didn't know why she would think of that then. But she did think of it, and she asked me, and I said, yes, I remember. And I recounted them for her, and she was satisfied. And then less than 72 hours, she had died. Now, in the, in, in the final analysis, that request was a tremendous gift for me because it allowed me to return to the wilderness, uh, both initially to mourn her and later through these rituals of scattering her ashes to celebrate the power of the wilderness, what it had meant to her life, how it had shaped her and how it had shaped us. And uh, finally, in the end, uh, five years later, before I made the last scattering, to really help me know who I was, what was my new role, who had I become by this journey through grief, by virtue of this journey through grief. So I wanted to read a few short excerpts from that book. In between these readings, uh, I would love to have some conversation. Because this journey is not, and this is why I'm so glad Mary's here, this journey is not just about personal grief. This process, the wheel turning from a loss to figuring out who you are, applies to all sorts of things. It, it can apply to divorce, it can apply to political elections, it can apply to um, sickness, it can apply to every kind of ordinary loss that we go through. Um, Stanley Kunitz, the poet, once said, how will the heart reconcile itself to this feast of losses? And that's really some of our challenge, is how does the heart remain not only resilient, but perhaps even grow and expand in the face of our losses? So, we're about to start this story, and one last thing I wanted to say about story. Story is almost like the air we breathe. Human beings have evolved for whatever reason to need story. Robert Bly, the poet, was, was once asked, what's the definition of adulthood, Robert? The interviewer asked him, and he didn't blink. He said, adulthood is the ability to take the random chaotic events that flow through everyday life and invest them with meaning by turning them into story. And that's what we do. And that's what Mary and I are going to talk with you. It's a, a definition of adulthood is to take the adulthood. What does it mean to be an adult? Yeah, what does it mean to be an adult? Right. Take these random events, invest them with meaning by turning them into story. And so this is what we're going to explore a little bit tonight. So let me start out, if I may, with uh, the first of these fairly short readings from to carry home. And again, thank you all for, for being here. It's such a pleasure to be with you. The end came for Jane, and so for us at the edge of spring. When the leaves of the North Country were washed in that impossible of lemonade green, a color she said always reminded her of a certain crayon in the old Crayola 64 boxes she had as a kid, one labeled simply yellow-green, a clumsy name with no hint of the promise it held, which was like an early thought of summer before summer gets quickened by the sun. I was struck by how easily, how routinely she made such connections, coupling little shards of nature she found as an adult to some encounter when she was young. More than wild country was a way in, a means of inciting the sweet startle of childhood. Over our 25 years together, I came to learn such magic too. But with her death on the Kapka River, I was suddenly senseless, trying to remember how it all works. I find myself in some early memory of my own when nature was first nudging my heart, but the memory was brittle, like a great creature gone extinct, surviving a museum exhibit, a Javan tiger, an atlas bear, something formerly amazing, but now just a stiff swatch of fur propped up behind a pane of glass. And I doubted the world could spin out something so compelling ever again. 
We were born at the back 40 of the baby boom, in the corn and the rust. Jane in the farm country of southern Indiana, me in the blue-collar bricks and smokestacks of the north. Like a million other kids, squeezing our halcyon days out of loose meanderings through flutters of nature. City parks and stray woodlots, cattail marshes and hedgerows and creek banks, living spring through fall with wind-tossed hair and dirty feet. Only later did we come to realize the extent to which we'd been wandering in jagged, reckless times. Times when nature was going to ruin. As I was climbing up sugar maples along the sidewalks of South Bend, Indiana, 45 miles near the town of Gary, U.S. Steel was every day dumping 75 tons of oil, ammonia, mercury, phenols, and cyanide into the Calumet River. Before long, it started catching fire. Women living near that river, mostly poor African-American women, were in the 1960s and 70s giving birth to babies deformed by mercury poisoning. Meanwhile, their husbands and brothers and fathers and sons were coming home every day from working at the steam plants, stopping in some worn patch of grass outside the back door to spit dark spatters of coke dust. By 1964, my brother and I could be found knotting hickory sticks into toy boats with pieces of string, then tossing them into lines of ditch water sheeted with DDT. To this day, I can recall that certain sweet, heavy tang that hung in the air every spring, the smell of dioxin and phenols, some of it coming from the cornfields around town, still oozing from the boat channels to the southeast where we sometimes went swimming. North of where we lived at a Dow plant in Midland, Michigan, those same chemicals were being mixed with jet fuel, poured into 55-gallon drums, and shipped to Vietnam as Agent Orange. Down in the southern part of the state where Jane lived, nature wasn't faring all that much better. During her senior year of high school, Secretary of Agriculture Earl Butts arrived at her family's farm, announcing to the Stewarts and their neighbors that the time had come to plant, quote, fence row to fence row. It would take just two years for the last corners of mystery and modest disorder in that part of rural Indiana. Those fabled Midwestern hedgerows, final holdouts for the fox and hooded warbler and raccoon to all but disappear. Plowed under to make way for still more corn and soybeans. One day out with Jane's dad on a slow drive around the farm, I listened to him tell how the wildlife he'd hunted as a boy but food on the table had nearly vanished. Turkey, possums, game birds, mostly gone. Get big, Earl Butts said to him in 1973, or get out. Foremost on our minds in those years was the hope that the last of America's big unfettered landscapes might help us sustain the open-heartedness of youth. That encounters with the wild might yield some measure of light we could use to clarify a path through adulthood. We figured there were still lots of places where such things could happen, in the hickory hills of the Appalachians, or the jack pine of the North Woods, in the ice-blasted granite crags of northern New England or the big redwoods of the West Coast, and if not there, then surely in the sagebrush deserts and aspen forests, the fast-dancing rivers and wind-blasted peaks of the Rockies. Curiously, 30 years before we were born, another Hoosier from a beat poet named Kenneth Rexroth took a good look around the Midwest and shook his head. There was nothing left in the way of mythology, he grumbled, nothing to take the place, quote, of the gods and goddesses and heroes and demigods of the ancient world. With the curl and whim of that gone from our lives, Rexroth suggested, what we were mostly left with was a conspicuous, gnawing hunger to consume. What's more, he said, if imagination was ever to really flower again, if we were powerful enough to keep us awake, it would mean reimagining our connections to nature. Rex Roth wasn't trying to bring back Apollo and Hermes and Dionysus. He was just pushing for the return of minds big enough, boisterous and generous enough to imagine them in the first place. Minds intrigued enough to midwife new versions of everything from technology to art, scholarship to love. See lively, he advised. See it whole. Let the years be paced by the comings and goings of the seasons 
What's more, learn to see that each of these seasons lives in all the others. Winter in the blooms of summer, spring in the fading leaves of fall. As it happened, my first chance to see life steadily, see it whole, would come in the summer Jane and I married, working for the Forest Service, living in a tiny rust-red cabin not 300 feet square on the bank of the Salmon River in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. The door jams and floorboards of the little cottage had gone crooked as a coyote's hind leg from 60 years of frost heaves. Out front was a tiny weathered porch so tilted that the owner of the place, a 75-year-old former sheep herder named Stan Jenkins, cut short the two side legs of a chair to make it possible to sit without tipping over. Pleased with that success, he next set about fitting the two lone kitchen cabinets with screen door hook and to keep the doors from swinging open. The place had no sink, no running water, Dishes and other washing beyond daily plunges in the river, we managed out of a large metal pan hung from a ten-penny nail on the kitchen wall. The toilet was forty yards away in the corner of an off-kilter mouse gray barn. Directly above the open rear tank of the commode, a faucet and pipe dropped from a large metal drum balanced in the rafters, which was filled by a hundred feet of garden hose attached to a small electric pump submerged at the edge of the river. Toilet visits were anxious as we were always looking up, trying to gauge the general soundness of the cracked sheet of plywood Stan used to hold the drum. Inside the cabin, without getting up from the edge of the old iron bed, we could reach the table door closet in 1950 Frigidaire. A cracked Formica dining table drooped under the west window where we ate bean burritos and looked out into the river 15 feet away and beyond that to the rugged face of the sawtooths shouting at the sky. Across the room, under the one other window, I cobbled together a desk from scraps of wood lying about the ranch where I sat in the dim light of evening and wrote about the day. Something good was in play for us along that wild river. Something in the sky, in meadows lit with paintbrush and prairie smoke and sink foil. It was an incomprehensible, big, soaring backdrop. And not a day went by when it didn't throw off sparks. We were opened up in that country, suddenly able to think beyond corn and rust, navigating our days by following whatever whims of curiosity the land ignited. A mile away from our little cabin on a dirt street in the heart of Stanley, Idaho, was the Casino Club, where every August dozens of young singles planning to stay the winter in that frigid valley came together to kick off what was known as the mating season. With every passing week, they drank and danced across the gritty hardwood floors with growing urgency, more desperate as the month wore on to find a tolerable partner to help split wood and warm the sheets without driving each other crazy before spring broke the following May. Often it didn't work out that way. I mean the part about not driving each other crazy. And on the summer nights that followed, we'd sit drinking beer in the hot springs along the Salmon River, listening to those who'd spent tell of fiery breakups and cabin swaps, of 40 below nights when cars froze up outside Casanova Jacks, leaving everyone to sleep on the floor of the bar on a bed of beer cans and peanut shells, or tales about the day the sheriff, said to be wrestling with relationship troubles of his own, high-centered his snow machine on a lodgepole pine beyond the, behind the ranger station, then in a fit of rage pulled out his pistol and shot the tree in half. It wasn't life out of balance, but rather life brilliantly off balance. Those big lands, and just as important what such places did to the people who lived there, helped us realize that we'd likely never really know what made either people or places tick. We were all wild, all mysterious, all worth a closer look. Kenneth Rexroth was fond of telling a tale from childhood a 90-year-old Native American man named Billy Sunlight, living in a chicken coop at the edge of a woodlot near Rex Roth's grandmother's home on the Elkhart River. The old man took a shine to the boy, guiding him on outings to watch otters swimming in the river, gathering herbs, teaching him the Potawatomi names of animals and birds and woodland flowers. One day he came calling on Billy, only to open the door to his chicken coop and find the old man dead in his bunk, his hands crossed over his chest, 
luminous look on his face. Rex Roth later wrote that he wasn't afraid, that Billy had talked about his death with him, and it seemed just as it should be. Even so, as the weeks and months went by, sometimes Rex Roth got terribly lonely, ended up crying for his old friend. But not because he was dead, really, only because he was gone from me and from the woods we loved. He was about seven then, a boy who a friend, one who'd made it all the way to 90. I was a middle-aged man, one who'd lost my wife and best friend of 25 years to a cold, dark river not two weeks past her 50th birthday. And yet, from where I now stand, the difference seems one of degree. For me, as for that little boy, the lingering nut of the ache was in the fact that she was gone not just from me, but from the wild country we came to love. My question would come in the form of a last request Jane made years before, asking me if she died to scatter her ashes in her five favorite wilderness areas. And so I did. Five treks to five unshackled landscapes. At first, the journeys broke my heart. Later, they helped me piece it together again. In the end, those trips would bring me back to nature again, to wilderness, to the lilting beauty of unkempt places, powerful enough to woo the hearts not only of the young, but of anyone willing to put down the search for meaning for a little while and just float in the sensations of being alive. I'm going to share a little excerpt from the second scattering journey I took, and then I'd love to get into this conversation I've been promising you with Mary. These scattering journeys, a couple of them were made in the first year, and they were all about quite literally falling on my knees and weeping what had been lost to me and to the wilderness we loved. And Gosh, there was such a need in those first steps of a difficult journey to be present, present moment awareness. And nature had always given me that. So even though I was desperately unhappy and in some ways would have loved to have been in the past or the future, by being out again in the natural world, and here too was the gift of her asking me to do this, I was much more able to simply surrender to all that pain. And when years passed, and I finished up the scattering journeys many years later, four or five years later, then I had walked through, and we're going to talk about that journey, but I had walked through far enough to realize that what I was doing now in scattering her ashes was to celebrate her life, celebrate having known her, and to celebrate the return to the world for me. So these rituals had much different effect depending on when they were done. So here's a little excerpt, and then we'll, then we'll talk a bit. During our years in Montana, we'd made dozens of ski trips into small Forest Service guard stations and field cabins. And the one we visited most was a couple hours south of Red Lodge in the southern area of Wyoming, two miles by trail up a remote river valley cradled by Engelman spruce and Douglas fir. We spent seven Thanksgivings there, each time arriving with backpacks topped with bags of turkey, cooked the night before, mashed potatoes and canned oysters and cranberry sauce and red wine and cheese and salami and olives and French bread. And always, too, ingredients for the one cocktail Jane was especially fond of on winter trips, the snowshoe, her version being a mix of jack high-octane peppermint schnapps called rumplemints, poured into a Sierra cup chilled with icicles plucked from the roof. Known as the Wood River Cabin, this too was on the list of the places she wanted her ashes scattered. I'd left in early winter of that first year on a sun-drenched Thanksgiving morning, six months to the day following her death. Over the phone, one of the locals told me there was no snow, not to bother bringing skis, but I arrived to find a good ten inches on the ground. With no shoes, that would mean two miles of post-holing. Soon after leaving the parking lot and crossing the river on a steel footbridge, though, I crossed a lone set of prints from a big wolf. He was going south, the same direction as me, and the travel was made easy by placing my feet in the deep dents made by his paws. Except for a couple 
of short side trips, his route was unwavering. While at first I had to focus to match his gait, by the time I reached the timber, maybe a half mile in, I could do it without even looking. Stepping past the same down trees and ice-covered rock faces he'd passed an hour or so earlier. When his tracks finally left the trail and drifted east across the frozen river, I was only 40 yards from the cabin. The place looked the same. A one-room cabin, 12 feet by 20, the walls made of small, unstained pine logs bleached by the sun. A pile of spruce and aspen wood taken from the surrounding forest, split and stacked, ready for the wood stove. Out in the yard was the same old freestanding signboard meant to hold a forest map, but as usual, holding no map at all, which made weirdly profound the words carved into the bottom of the empty frame, You are here. <laughs> Inside the single 12-foot square room were three wooden chairs and a small sink with no running water, shelves too with extras of everything from matches to lamp wicks, tampons to toilet paper. And on a flat board braced to the wall in the back of the room, several feet of books, Gretel Ehrlich's The Solace of Open Spaces, and Bradford Angier's How to Stay Alive in the Woods, The Virginian by Owen Wister, a couple field guides, a fistful of daily bread booklets for those hungry for morsels from the Lord, and on the very end, Jack London's White Fang. The previous Thanksgiving, with the Coleman lantern burning, it would be the last book I ever read aloud to her. What I was most interested in was the cabin journal, which Jane carried in on our first visit, making a gift of it to those who followed. Dozens of visitors used it, mostly families, many who, like us, ended up adopting the little cottage, caring for it by bringing in everything from rugs to stuffed chairs, lanterns to saucepans. Though none of us ever met, across the years we came to know a little something about each other through the pages of the journal. Who catches fish and who snores? Who's good at spotting moose? Who trekked to the outhouse in the middle of a frigid winter night, looked up and saw God staring back from the stars? I left a few new lines letting everyone know that Jane had died. Setting about the usual chores, filtering water, carrying firewood, as the last of the daylight leaked out of the sky, out behind the cabin I caught a glimpse of shadowy movement. Not 15 feet away was a beautiful bobcat, a color of dried grass. She walked slowly out from behind a juniper coming toward me. Then she stopped and just stood there staring into my eyes. It was uncanny behavior. And once again, I heard myself saying out loud, Jane? She considered me for what seemed close to five minutes, calm, blinking, swishing her tail. Then she turned and walked up the slope, disappearing into a loose stand of timber. I didn't bother spinning theories about why one of the shyest creatures on the continent decided to give me such a long and careful look. I didn't sit in the snow and reconsider reincarnation. There was only the beauty of it. After the cat wandered off, I headed inside and wished it well. The next day dawned clear and cold. I heated up a little water on the Coleman stove, threw a tea bag into a travel mug, put on a coat and hat and gloves, and walked down to the Wood River and there began tracking the water the day before. Still more ice had formed in the night, fanning out in teardrop shapes from the downstream edges of half-submerged granite boulders. The wolf had continued upstream walking in a straight line, staying close to the water, finally veering off after a couple miles to begin a sharp climb into the gnarled foothills of Standard Peak. I could have followed his tracks all day, leaned hard into the effort, and I would never have come close to catching him. Returning to the cabin, I gathered the vase from where I'd placed it the night before in front of an east-facing window, pulled the silver spoon out of my backpack, went outside, and made my way around to the back of the cabin. Though it was probably 10 o'clock in the morning, the air was still cold, sharp against my nose, smelling like winter. Maybe it was because I knew this would be the last scattering for a while, probably for months, that I stood for a long time out there in the snow, taking in every detail, trying to drive it to memory. But what registered wasn't so much details of the surroundings as a simple feeling of ease, contentment as if other than just being there under that cold November sun, standing calf-deep in the snow, there was nothing I needed to do. 
After a time, I moved up the hill, took out the spoon, and cast some of Jane's ashes on that east-facing slope. They fell without a sound, drifting like a thousand tiny feathers in the hollows of that bobcat's footprints. As Mary gets ready to come up here, I wanted to mention one other thing before we start talking with each other. Years ago, I started teaching, uh, about 10 years ago, in a Master's of Fine Arts program called the Rainier Writing Workshop. And one of the things I teach my students has to do with what mythologists have for a long time, Campbell being the one who made it famous, referred to as the hero's journey. Uh, and many of you are, are familiar with that. The hero's journey is thought to be really the oldest archetype story blueprint. And it's celebrated because it's understood as this is how adventures happen. This is how people's lives unfold in this way of described by the hero's journey. It's such a part and parcel of novels that we read, the shows we watch, the movies we see. George Lucas was a, a big fan of uh, Joseph Campbell, and he wrote the Star Wars trilogy entirely based on the hero's journey motif. Now, there are lots of different simple and complicated descriptions of the hero's journey. The one that I tended to use is pretty simple for my students. And lo and behold, with Jane's death, I found myself living it too. This was not less than the story of how life works. And I found it incredibly comforting at various times when I thought there would be no end to the pain and the suffering to remember that grief is a wheel that keeps turning. The first phase, if you will, of the hero's journey has to do with the loss of identity. We no longer know who we are. I certainly can vouch for that being the primary feeling I had when Jane died. I was no longer, I was no longer in a, that primary relationship of 25 years. I had little connection to the world around me because I was numb and sad and depressed and angry at times and feeling betrayed at other times. And that loss of identity is what starts the hero. And of course, I'm using that in a genderless way, women and men. That's what starts the hero uh, on the journey. And as Joseph Campbell said, sometimes you pick the myth, sometimes the myth picked the journey, the myth picked me this time. And whether you're ready or not, here you go, here you go. And the more you resist it, the longer and more painful the journey becomes. So after the initial loss of identity, that yields ultimately in time to a wandering phase, a very difficult time where you don't know which ends up. You can go left, right, backwards, forwards. You think you know what your path is supposed to be, only to find a month or so later that you and you have such an undermining of your sense of direction and confidence and calling in the world. And this is the phase where I think American culture is particularly troubled. Nobody likes to go around not having a plan. And the wandering phase is not friendly to plans. It tends to shred them as soon as you make them. And so it was not uncommon for people to be, after a few months, I think somewhat frustrated with me because I didn't show obvious signs of getting any better. It wasn't a linear growth. I was wandering. And just to know that that was an important part of the process was very comforting to me. It helped me be a little kinder to myself. Sometimes in the Middle Ages, people going through difficult transitions would put an empty chalice or an empty cup on the bedstand, and they would wake up and see that cup in the wandering phase, essentially, and know that there was nothing in, it, there was nothing in them. They didn't have a sense of who they were anymore. They didn't know where they were going. But the empty cup off, often also reminded them that one day, that cup would be filled again. So many of the rituals that you find, especially associated with death and grief and coming of age, have to do with the hero's journey motif. In fact, I would argue that the primary rituals and ceremonies that we've developed over thousands of years as human beings are actually, in fact, meant to anchor the points of the story that I'm telling you about. So there's loss of identity, there's wandering. At some point, a third phase starts to bleed in and out, 
a kind of a glimpse of a new identity. And then finally, ultimately, there is the new identity planted in the larger community. Tecumseh leaves Chillicothe with his face blackened. He walks out of his home and nobody looks at him because he's being treated as if he's invisible. His identity. He's going out on his vision quest. He does not exist as the boy anymore. He comes back many days later with a, essentially rituals meant to honor the wandering, meant to honor and invite the spirit in to give him a new sense of identity. He comes back to the village. The elders help him process what he's experienced. He gives the gift of his experience to the elder. And by virtue of what he's gone through, he becomes known only then as Tecumseh. So the rituals are meant to anchor the story. And so knowing that was a big, big help. That wheel would turn, and even though I didn't like where I was, someday it would get better. So, Mary, would you come up here and let's, let's talk. Here, let me get you a mic. It's really good to see you all. Yeah. Thanks for being here. I've only been able to drop into Omaha over the years to see Mike and Heidi and their kiddos. Um, and it's nice to be here for a while and with Gary. I didn't know you were going to bring me up exactly like this, honey. We had, <laughs> we had this conversation, given the way that um, life has turned in the past three days for all of us. Uh, some of us may be really pleased and thrilled, and others may be feeling different feelings. But we had this thought that it might be good to consider that in the context of the things that Gary has been talking about. But before we start, you've been talking about this, um, the hero's journey. Mm. And you talked about it as if it, it was kind of a theory, but it had a comfort to you because you knew that there must be something you could count on in it if it had that much tradition behind it. Is that so? I think that's true. I, I knew it as a part and parcel of essential storytelling, which is great for me as a writer. So if I'm going to write a biography of a great scientist or write a memoir by knowing the hero's journey motif and steering you as a reader through that sense of ending and beginning, you're going to be pretty satisfied as a reader. This is what George Lucas knew when he started to write Star Wars trilogy. In being cast into this difficult situation, this tragedy of Jane dying, then the story, the, the truth of that particular blueprint began to flow through me, began to be completely aligned in, in the blood and bones of my life. And so I got to see and sense a bit of why people over the millennial ha millenniums have been so comforted by the story, by the story blueprint. And so I was able to take it from just a handy tool to know how to write and entertain you to appreciating it as something that happens to us whenever we go through a significant transition. One of, one of the things that we have been working on together because of my background in human development is that you can see people develop consistently from being something to having something. Mm -hmm. So you moved from kind of being a a, a craftsman with words using the hero's journey in that way to having it. I, I think so. I think so. And it's probably something all of us have anyway. Um, the part that he said about how wandering, we're not big fans of the wandering bit in this culture. You know, it's like, uh, come on, you know, heal already, get over it, let's, let's get happy again, because we're all uncomfortable with that part. But this kind of community gives the room for people to be wandering. And it sounds to me like this, who do you say that I am? That's all about wandering. But it's also about another thing that I would suggest right this minute. I am experiencing as a big difficulty for people like, I, I, this is an assumption. I think that this is an artifact of our culture for me. And that is, we also have real trouble admitting to ourselves that has been slammed. When it's slammed like your story, 
you can't, there's no way, you don't have any option but to admit it. But there's other times when we just as soon say, oh, no, it's all right. I, I still know who I am. This question you all have been asking yourself through this series, who do you say that I am, that was posed by Jesus Christ, right? Who was saying, you know and I know that there's nothing different. We are one another. Are. But it matters who you say that I am because you can only say I am as much as you know about you. That's identity. And so we have really been struck in the past three days by how much identity, whether it ex the experience is positive or negative at this juncture or in between, identity has been shaken up. And we're having to ask ourselves, who are we now? Who am I now? What can I stand on now? How's it going to look now? How's it going to work now? Maybe I'm optimistic. Maybe I'm a little concerned. Maybe I'm a lot concerned. Who, it, it varies across the whole spectrum, and there's room for all of it. But nonetheless, the question is that. It's one of identity. And so Gary's story can be particularly helpful right now in hearing oh, things happen. And somehow, we keep putting one foot in front of the other. So we had an idea, and, and we wanted to see if we could get, I think we've got time for this, get you all talking with one another, which is different in these kinds of interactions, and then talking back with us. Still want to give that a go? Sure, let's give it a go. Okay. Yeah. So what, what we want is for you to turn to someone near you. Um, it looks like twos or threes will work. And, and anybody, yeah. And it just kind of, all right, pick out who you're going to talk with. And the question is this. What do you have to say right now off the top that, that you feel comfortable right now saying, or it may feel uncomfortable, whatever, you can do that. Um, <laughs> what do you have to say about who you are and about your sense of being solid in identity compared with how you felt four days ago, compared with how you felt, say, two years ago? All right? That's a lot to do in five minutes. There's no way to do it wrong or right. See to mind, okay? So we're going to give, let's see, Could, let's, are people in twos or threes? And if you're by yourself, see if you can find somebody. Show me some dyads. And, and the task of the person not talking is just to listen, just to listen. Great. Who needs a dyad? Who needs another person? You going to do the three of you? Yeah, that works. Good. Okay. So let's take 10. We're going to give you, we're going to be ruthless timekeepers, maximum 10 minutes. And this is the conversation. Your job, because you understand what love beyond, what is it, all imagination? You understand what that means. Your job. Are you with me? Your job is to make sure everybody gets to speak. Okay, so if there are three of you, make sure everybody gets to speak. Ready, go. So, identity. Can you turn yours
Okay, take 30 more seconds to wrap that up. Make sure everybody's spoken. Okay, I'll ask. Okay, and then you. Let's go up here. You want to? We can drink some water. I'm on. Okay. Thank you for having that conversation. Does someone want to share anything that came up? We'd love to, to Something hear. Something that you learned, that you Something know now you that you didn't know before. Yeah. Don't all talk at once. I hate that. Who, who has something to share? Oh, yes, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. I, I, I realized I'm probably more alone than I thought I was uh, in this journey because uh, the vision of Christianity that I thought was widespread and there's an essential goodness in the heart seems to be somewhat flawed because it's been, it supports... Uh, racism and sexism and uh, I believe the word is xenophobia and I find myself thinking well where does that fit within the Christian perspective that I have journeyed along and in my mind if I hear somebody say what would Jesus do once after supporting that I'll probably be pretty cynical and I find just that that journey that you describe is probably going to be than I thought it was mm. Mm, thank you, thank you. And, and that, all by itself, can be kind of crushing. However, this is absolutely true. I mean, you have to check it out. We all have to check it out for ourselves. It doesn't matter what I say. But it seems true in my experience, and then you check it out, that um, in the end, the only one who can make the changes in my life, the only one who can walk through, anything like the hero's journey in my life is me. In fact, the only one that I have much say over at all is me. And then sometimes people get caught in recirculation pools and they don't feel like they have a lot of say then. So I am alone in that. However, look at you. You're in social company. All of us, any of the changes, any of the transitions we go through are necessarily social. Two, they affect other people. Other people are involved and touched too. They may be touched differently, but they're touched. And so we lean in and we learn from each other. So even though I'm the only one who can do it, I can lean in and learn from other people. Yeah, and, and, and great wisdom masters from the ages. Joseph Campbell loved to say, you're not on this journey alone. Thousands and thousands of people have gone through it before you. And so you not only have the wisdom of each other in this room, you have the wisdom of people who have gone many, many, many decades and, and centuries before. And that wisdom and that tradition, including, of course, that of Jesus, is available, available, always, always. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, here, let me bring oh. There's many legs, and it never ends. Oh, thank you, thank you. Never ends. That's so true. We That's were so speaking true. of that, Gary. Say something about the um, while while you moved from being the journey to having the journey. You moved into having it. Right, yeah. That that wasn't the end. You've been on this hero's journey again, right? Oh, yes, and and again and again. The wheel does keep turning, you're right. What did you say? Well, it's not like you go through the hero's journey once, and you get it, and then you're done. It's like, oh, you get it, and then, oh, you get to get it again. Mary <laughs> found a story of a little girl talking to her grandfather and saying, 
uh, Grandpa, tell me a story with a happy ending. And Grandpa says, that's impossible. And she says, it's impossible to have a happy ending? He says, no, it's impossible to have an ending. And so it does keep spinning. The wheel keeps spinning. And that's not something to dread. There's great power and freedom in the surrender to that fact. It's just the way it is. You know, another thing that I'm feeling compelled to say right now is, is again, you have to check it for yourself. Take it or leave it, check it out for yourself. But it seems to me, well, let me check this. I look around this room and it seems to me everybody in this room was born. Yeah, I think we can safely say that. Okay, and that means we've made it to today, here together. And that means some things have been working. We tend to pay attention to the stuff that's not working, the stuff that's uncomfortable. And, you know, that's that bad habit of, if I can clean it all up, finally I'll get to relax and be happy. And then we get slammed by something else. So the thing that I want to say to you all, and to myself, and to you, just to remind us all, is that we are all magnificent improvisation artists. Whether we want to be or not, we are. We are here, and whatever comes our way, we do it on our own, and we lean into one another. What else? Here, Mike. Yes. I, <clears throat> uh, listening to that, I was struck by a passage in the book that you didn't read, um, and I don't know if I'm going to get to it, but you were reflecting on somewhere you had been with Jane, and um, where you guys were imagining what it would be like to live a long time ago when natives were nomadic, hunting, gathering, and, and, and you made a comment, I think it was to her, about how, how, what would it be like to have life be so fragile? I think she's actually made that comment. It's where one slip up and... Yeah. And you said, I think that would cause you to worry a lot. And she said, actually, I think it would free you from worry. And reading that passage and thinking about what you just said is helpful to me as you experience the up and down of that cycle yeah. to say, uh, maybe when things are really bad, I don't have to worry. Maybe when things are tenuous, I'm at the bottom of that push down or whatever they call it in the water. I'm going to worry about coming back up. Maybe I just need to let go or my leg is in this leg hold. Yeah, I don't know. thank you, Mike, for mentioning that. That's, that's really perfect. That's really appropriate. Those, those were wise words. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think it's true that the fragility of life and not knowing what was coming next to a lot of indigenous people wouldn't be a source of constant worry. It's living now, dealing with what's in front of you, and then life unfolds, you know. And what, a, what an easy thing to say and a difficult thing to do, but yeah. Something else, yes. I have a question from that didn't after I read your book in um, experiencing um, men grieve in my own life and the journey. I was wondering whether um, your grief process, if you were free to do that, or if there were people that questioned what you were doing or how long you took to do it, or um, anything like that. Great question, and and yes, I don't. I would say that most of them really didn't share it overtly, but there was a kind of impatience with some people who really desperately wanted the best for me. So their impatience was predicated on the fact that you're not performing as well as I think you should or could, but it also brings to mind if something like this happens to me, I want to know that I'm going to be able to pop back up and be generally out of it before too long. So I'm the mere at that point, or anyone who goes through grief, I'm the mirror that you have to look and consider whether or not your life would be that overwhelmed at times, or somehow within a fairly short time, you know, resurfaced and, and all is well again. And so I think it was a, a desperate aspect of people being very uncomfortable with the fragility of life in general and how tenuous it is and how so many other things happen to us. They just, I think, needed me to become the poster child for 
don't worry, even if this happens, it's not that bad and it'll be over pretty soon. And I didn't necessarily deliver. And because of that hero's journey motif and because of understanding that the wheel would turn, I was kinder to myself than I normally ever would be. I was as compulsive and, and anxious as any of them in much about life. But knowing that I'm in a wandering phase and that I cannot perceive when it will end sort of gets me back to the freedom of just simply being there. You know, and, and so that was good for me, but for a lot of them it was uh, frustrating. Yeah, frustrating. The most powerful um, friend I had at the time would come over and simply sit. Listen, there was no fixing it, and men, we love to fix things. You know, if you tell me you're sad, I want to make you happy. I, I, I have to work on that all the time. If Mary's having anything going wrong, I want to fix it. And it's quite disrespectful, actually, to want to fix it. You know, it's really better to just witness the unfolding. And that's what this friend did. And just one friend who can do that is such a powerful blessing. Do you know, I also know, yes, sir. Political process. What's the role that of that acceptance? Role? Yeah, you know the the thing. Acceptance is well. I, you know, I I think that this might be a good segue into Gary. In addition to the hero's journey, had done some work on myths that he can tell you about. But had come to he found for this grief process, and I think it acceptance is down the road. First, you have to let yourself not know anything and have all the different feelings. <laughs> yeah. Well, that. my daughter, <laughs> who is about to turn 30, I can't believe it, um, was on the phone last night, and I, I was in a better... It's good when one of us is losing it, the other one's in a better place. You know, when that happens, it's always convenient. Um, and... And it came to me that right now, people, whatever they're feeling, we're rotten at that too. Just letting us ourselves feel. Just feel it. You know, she was saying, I can't go into work tomorrow. I said, well, that would be all right. She said, yeah, but they'll think I'm just the one that can't handle the election outcome. I said, honey, feel it. Feel it, because she wants to be of service in her life, like all of you do. If she doesn't feel it, she can't accept, and she can't be of service. There's no so oh, sorry. I want the, go in and do the, the oh, three, yeah, yeah. The I, three I, helpers help us move to acceptance. Before, I well, I'm going to do this last little epilogue reading, and then, and then wind, we'll wind it up. I do want to say, though, that the Greeks had a wonderful definition for beauty. The ancient definition for beauty, one of them was to be of one's hour. So no matter what life gives you, the beautiful thing to do is to be of that hour. And if you're hopeless, and if, or if you're deliriously happy, or if you're frustrated and frightened, frightened, frightened by virtue of an election or anything else in your life, that is the hour. And the most beautiful thing you can do is to be there. Now, that doesn't sound very satisfying, but it can be extremely powerful and allow you to end up being someplace else because you're not spending energy wishing you weren't in the moment. So I'm going to finish with this epilogue, and then I wanted to tell you um, something that's become very, very important to me in this whole hero's journey process. As I write this in early February, the creek that rolls past my back door is frozen fast. Little sign of it save the wide path it carved through the belly of the valley long ago in the time of ice. My experience this time of year has completely changed since Jane's death. Not that I haven't always liked winter, shoosing down untracked slopes on telemark skis, hooking tow ropes to cars with friends and pulling each other down old forest roads at dubious speeds. But now I spend a fair amount of time simply taking in the woods. Sometimes, during storms, I watch white-tailed deer coalescing into lines, breaking trail through the deep snow. Small 
akin to the little piece of miracle that so comforted my mother when she was dying. And at the same time, a part of the grand stories Kenneth Rexroth talked about, pieces of the myths that make us human. The tragedy has left me feeling more aligned with that Inuit notion Jane and I ran across in the Arctic, the one that claims the whole world can be comprehended by paying attention to the relationships at your feet. I also find myself trying to figure things out, childlike things of little consequence, like just how long a bald eagle is willing to sit on the cottonwood branch outside the house and scan the creek for fish before he gives up the effort and tries someplace else. It's in the woods just beyond my door where I'm likely to recall that life as we know it wouldn't even arise in the first place unless it also passed away. Each morning now, all through the winter, there arise to the edge of the creek a plain little bird, the dipper, jumping off blocks of ice in even the worst weather to pluck larvae from the bottom of the stream, then back up onto the ice again where she bobs up and down for a time, looking like a little kid about to wet her pants because she's got something important to say. Jane and I used to pretend the dipper we saw across our 14 years together in this house was the same bird. We called her Darlene. For reasons I don't fully understand, winter, if not my favorite season, is in these days the one I'm most drawn to. On every night of cloudless sky, Orion and Gemini, Gemini and Libra come rolling overhead through heavens so clear I can see starlight shimmering in the forest. A time well after the end of things and long before they begin again when every morning I stand in the living room, arms down and my face inches away from the east-facing window, breathing in and breathing out, considering one more time the right kind of devotion needed to conjure from that snow and ice the buds of spring. There's good news these days mixed in with all the craziness as we push together into this new millennium, but then I suppose that's the way it's always been. African Americans in the Yerba Buena section of San Francisco are grinding for the green, keeping rem keep reminding me that we still have choices. Hundreds of people are making heroic efforts to uh, establish critical wildlife migration corridors, including a passage from Yellowstone through the Canadian Rockies all the way to the Yukon. Little kids are running around Yellowstone deliriously happy. And my hometown of Red Lodge there, a nature camp has been started in Jane's honor. Now every summer, kids get the chance to traipse through meadows of flocks and forget-me-nots, kneel on the banks of mountain streams, shoulder their packs, and set off on the same trails she roamed all those years. And there's something else, too. Something truly amazing. Terry Tempest Williams once said about grief that it quote, dares us to love once more. In the spring of 2013, I took that dare. I met a remarkable woman from Portland named Mary Clare, a sociology professor, a listener, a champion of diversity and justice, and beyond that, a survivor of her own runs of heartbreak and calamity. We would fall in love in these uplands of the northern Rockies and also wandering that great northwestern city of hers amidst the azaleas and roses under the London plane trees of Laurelhurst Park. From the very beginning, we walked, walked everywhere. And six months after we met on a brilliant day in August, we walked to the lake, that place in the Beartooths where Jane's ashes had been scattered four years earlier. Standing on a ridge high above the eastern shore of the lake, Mary's hand in mine, I opened my mouth and called out into a warm southern breeze. Jane, I said, this is Mary. And far below, for a minute or so afterward, there was this dazzling little miracle of wind and water and light running up the south end of the lake. We married the following winter on Rock Creek on a morning in January when the dipper was flitting from ice flow to ice flow and the sun seemed like a village bonfire hanging in the air, lighting 14 inches of fresh snow. Our lives too, like every life, are unfolding as wilderness. On any given day there's both beauty and chaos, 
standing together, just as the Paiutes said they would. In some ways, the miles we're traveling together now have been sweetened by our wounds, by each of us having learned beyond the shadow of a doubt that nothing lasts forever. It isn't really fear that rises from such notions, such feelings of impermanence, at least not on our good days, but rather a simple appeal for presence, an invitation to life. And when we accept, there often comes a feeling of being on the finest, brightest of paths, free of future, unshackled by past. All of life encompassed in a single step, and then another, strung together like pearls in our long, precious journey from beautiful to goodbye. What I want to finish with is telling you something Mary alluded to that I learned when I was writing about stories and myths long ago, late 80s, early 90s. I was asked to put together a collection of nature stories from all over the globe. Uh, little tales about how things came to be, how the robin got her red breast and why rainbows are in the sky and fanciful tales that would entertain and put a smile on a reader's face. I went through probably 1,500 or 2,000 stories in various folklore collections around the country. And by the time I got through a couple hundred, it began to dawn on me, and I'm a little bit of a slow learner, but it began to dawn on me at that point that all of these storytellers around the world seem to be saying that living well in the world, living a good life, depended on maintaining a relationship with one or more of three qualities that these stories celebrated. Three qualities. These have been gold in my pocket. And they were gold in my pocket through that whole hero's journey motif in the wake of Jane's death. The first, they said, you must have a relationship to beauty. An active relationship with beauty. So, it's all well and good to go out to Jackson Hole and rent a condo and sit in a leather chair and look out the picture window at the Tetons with a martini in your hand and enjoy that beauty. But they were thinking of something a little more meditative. Um, to not walk out and see that the maple on the corner is beautiful this year and then having your mind fill the notion uh, your mind filled with the notion that, well, it's not quite as deeply red as it was last year. And I think it's probably a week earlier this year than it was last year. I wonder what that's about. Shut down that and just let the beauty flow through you. Whatever the beauty is. Music, art, for me it's been nature. Let it flow through you. Be present. Be present in the face of beauty. The second thing the storyteller said you needed to stay in touch with, have a quality relationship with, is... Mystery. Mystery. Ha, oh, what a great place to discuss mystery. You, you, none of you are unfamiliar with mystery. Einstein said all science and all art are the products of the mysterious. He used to tell his fellow mathematicians and physicists to, when they were stuck, go out into some small patch of the woods and just stand there and try to contemplate what's going on. Well, the fact of the matter is, even today, Today, with all our sophisticated science and ecology, we barely know what's going on in a square yard of dirt. You know, we're pretty smart, we're pretty clever, but we know so little. And he found that by himself going out and contemplating something that cannot be understood by the mind, by the rational left brain, he ended up surrendering to the fact that it was beyond his ability to perceive. And in that surrendered state, he said that's when he was able to find a path through to his most creative insights. And so he encouraged others to do the same. Mysterious, mystery, such a gift. And the last thing is what we're doing tonight. Maintain a relationship with community. Not just the earth and the birds and the trees and the sky and the clouds and the oceans and the rivers and the water that comes out of your faucet to keep you alive. Not just that, but with each other. And the bigger your community, the stronger you are. It's one interesting aspect of ecology that in the last 10 years it has become incredibly abundantly evident that the systems in nature that are most likely to persist, most likely to be resilient, are the systems that have the highest measure of diversity. 
So your community, the bigger it gets, the stronger it is and the longer it lives. Beauty, community, and mystery. And so those are the three blessings that I was given from those storytellers that I, and those are the three blessings I want to leave you with uh, tonight. Because in this journey that we've been talking about, you will need helpers. And those are among the best helpers when you're lost, when you're stuck in the wandering, when you don't know who you are. Those are what will nudge you forward. Do we have time for the butterfly story? Let me see. Do we? Oh, it's about 8.30. All right, okay, I'm going to tell a quick story. I love this story, and I haven't told it for a while, so... This was told to me by an Ojibwe woman named Amelia Lagarde. I met her on the shore of Lake Superior uh, in her little cottage in Duluth, and I came to talk to her about story and some of the perspectives that her people had on the natural world. And after we'd talked for about 30 or 40 minutes, I remember the windows were open and the smell of the lake was coming through. It was a summer day. It was beautiful weather. And Amelia Lagarde, who was about 75 years old, at one point got very quiet, and she leaned forward at her kitchen table with her wrinkled arms on that table, and this is what she told me. She said, a long time ago, Spirit woman gave birth to human babies, human twins. Now, these were the first little babies, first little humans anywhere on the planet. And it fell to the animal people to take care of them. And oh my goodness, were the animal people happy about this assignment. They really got into it. Every single night, Bear would come around and she'd take those little babies and hold them to her hairy chest and keep them warm. And then, it, and when the dawn came up the next morning, she'd lay them in the grass. And sure enough, here came Beaver. She'd take them down very carefully with those teeth of hers, down to the lake shore, dip them in the lake, get them all cleaned up, lay them in the grass to dry. Then it was dog. Dog would come, and oh my gosh, I can't begin to tell you how into these little babies dog was just sat there all day. And if a fly would bother them, the dog would snap at it, and get, get it off of them. And if they had colic or were unhappy, dog would put his wet nose on their belly and rub it around and make them laugh. This was really, really something. The animal people were so thrilled. Well, one Bear came up to the other animal people and said, look, I am having the best time of my life with these little human babies, and I suspect you are too, but something bothers me. We've been doing this for quite a while, and these little ones have not changed. They look like they did when we got them, and they're not doing anything different than they did when we got them all those moons ago. And everybody else was really relieved that somebody had the courage to bring this up, and they nodded their heads and said, yes, that's true, and dog sat up and he said, you know, Nanabush, the son of the west wind, is coming tomorrow and Nanabush will know what to do because Nanabush always knows what to do when we get into trouble. Nanabush did come the next day because he always came when the, when the animal people needed him. Went out into the grass, looked at the babies, nodded his head, listened to the story, said, you know, I think I know what's going on. First of all, you guys have taken phenomenal care of these little babies. Just amazing. I'm so happy with you. I'm so proud of you. You're an inspiration. But I think you maybe took too good care of them. Maybe you did things for them that they need to do themselves, that the young of all species grow, not by having everything handed to them, but by reaching and striving and getting a little uncomfortable and cranky and seeking something out. Maybe that is what's going on. I don't know what to do about it. That's my problem. So Nanabosch, as he had done countless times before, leaves the land of the trees up in what we now call Minnesota, heads across the prairies, gets to the Rocky Mountains, climbs to the biggest, tallest peak he can find, calls up to the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit comes because Nanabosch always found that the Great Spirit would come whenever he called them. Great Spirit listens to the story, tells Nanabosch, okay, here's what I want you to do. And Nanabosch just kind of winced because there was always some task assigned by the Great Spirit. This was not his first rodeo, and he knew something was coming. So this time the Great Spirit said, you see these beautiful colored stones, Nanabush? All over the mountain there were these beautiful stones with every color imaginable. He said, I want you to collect them all and put them in a pile. And then the Great Spirit left. 
And so Nana Bush started out and day after day after day putting these stones in a pile. Oh, it was probably halfway to the ceiling of this building by the time he was done. It was an amazing number of stones. Had no idea what he was do, supposed to do next. He played with them. He batted them around. He taught himself to juggle. He threw them up and caught them behind his back. He did everything and nothing was going on. Finally, though, one morning, he walks over to the edge of the stone pile. He picks up a few of them. He holds them in his hand. He throws them up in the air. And this time, they did not come down again. They turned into the most beautiful winged creatures. And they were the world's first butterflies. Oh, Nanabush knows what he needs to do now. He walks down out of the mountains, across the prairie. He's covered in a of butterflies. Walks up to the meadow. There are the little babies still laying in the sun, happy but unchanged. Wow, those little babies look and see those butterflies. And oh, wow, they want one of those butterflies. And they lay there and, you know, grasp at them. Well, you can't catch a butterfly that way. Oh, pretty soon they're crawling around and they're trying to get one. That doesn't work too well. Butterflies are too flighty for that. Pretty soon they're on their legs, walking, and before long they're running through the woods, holding out their legs, trying to catch even one of those beautiful creatures. And that, Amelia Lagarde told me, is how butterflies taught children to walk. Now, when I left Amelia Lagarde's house that June day, she stopped me at the screen door and she said, I hope you'll tell that story. We love that story. But I want you to understand, we don't tell that story to remind ourselves that kids shouldn't have everything given to them, that they need to reach out and strive and struggle for what they want. We pretty much understand that. We tell that story to people who are stuck. We tell people who are unsure which way to go. We tell people who are in pain, who are hurting that story, because it's the beauty of those butterflies that pulls us forward, that nudges us where we need to go. That's why we tell that story. And that's what I leave you with, that beauty, along with community and ministry, will nudge you, will call you, will invite you to go where you need to go next. So with that, thank you so much for being here this evening. I appreciate it so much. And thank you, Mary, as well. I don't know what's next. That's wonderful. Thank you thank so much. You. Wasn't he wonderful? Another round of applause for thank Gary. You. Thank, thank you, you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, we're going to give you a few minutes. I think that people oh. might want to sign. There are books available out there, and they might enjoy would, having would one be signed or to. so. Thank you. Um, and while we give him a couple of minutes to get out there, um, there are evaluation cards in your um, uh, programs. There we go. Uh, if you um, would be so gracious as to fill those out and leave them in the baskets at the door. We have coffee and cookies um, available as well. And I want to thank you for being here tonight, for being here um, all fall with our speaker series. Um, you're more than welcome to our uh, many events here over the Advent and Christmas season here at Countryside. And then um, I do have um, a note on there of a, a fantastic concert opportunity on February 26th that we're um, taking part in with Sammy Youssef, who's an international star. Um, he packs... Uh, uh, concert halls with 100,000 in Turkey and places like that, and we're getting him in Omaha, Nebraska. So um, I would encourage you, as soon as those tickets go for sale, to um, be sure to sign up. But thank you again so much for being here this evening and just for being who you are.